Well, hello and welcome everyone to the podcast. As always, we are honored to have the one, the only Mr. SGN on join us today to discuss all things financial and geopolitical throughout the whole and entirety of the world. And as always, if you are uh, a, a recent or a longtime subscriber, or if you're new to the channel, please do like and subscribe and share and click the notification bell so that you can make sure that you don't miss important podcasts such as today's. Mr. S. Gianon, good sir, thank you for joining us and how are you doing today? Doing well, my friend. Thank you for having me back. Always an honor. We, we look forward to it and I know our audience concurs as well. All right, well, we, uh, we pulled some juicy questions out of the vault for you today and the first one goes a little bit, S.G., like this. Um, in your estimation, from everything that you've studied and, and have gleaned in your, in your uh, intuitive knowledge, um, are we going to have an election in November, do you think, or do you see something else happening entirely, such as a military operation? Well, if, I'm, if I can be a little bit obtuse about answering the question, I sort of see both of the scenarios playing out in a similar fashion. We had a very um, significant communication come from President Trump on the 9th of June, the same day that Saudi Arabia decided they would not extend the petrodollar agreement, which essentially is the death spiral of the dollar now being put into motion, because again, we don't have anything else that backs that currency other than that worldwide acceptance status. So President Trump told us on the 9th of June, as he was discussing something about the the various fake, phony, and false charges that have been brought against him, these cases that are fake, all of these things, and he was highlighting that they know it's fake, but they say it anyway. And then he said, I hope the military, and he paused, and he restated, I hope the military revolts at the voting booth. Now, the mainstream legacy media hangs on every syllable that comes out of this man's mouth, because many of them are aware at some degree and at some level that they have engaged in the highest level treason event in modern U.S. history. Many of them are aware that this does not end well for them, and yet they have to play the part in the background for as long as they can. But President Trump's wording, uh, choosing the word revolt at the voting booth, that led me to think, you know, John, that perhaps we get all of the way to the election and between the various... Uh, chaotic events that get set off between now and then, if we were to see something like a steal in real time, heavily uh, um, heavily supported in the information space by good citizen journalism, then we could have the prerogative and the purview and the, and really the na the national justification to have some sort of step in, have some sort of a pause that amounts to an overthrow of the United States government. And we have all eyes of both the United States electorate base and the electorate base of, you know, essentially the entirety of the NATO West and a lot of the global South actually looking at what happens in the U.S. presidential election this year. So in this process between now and then, I think we could expect significant disruption and turbulence. This is a fight uh, for the ages, if you will, and at least on one side, it's existential for them. Many of these people are aware that they will at the very least go to prison. Many of them are aware that they will um, be expensed with at the end of this process due to the criminality and the travesty that they've been personally assistive to uh, you know, throughout the last four-year period. We're coming up on a four-year period now. But I think it's going to be very fascinating when we arrive at that election point, what the consciousness is willing to accept, what the mass civilization level agreement on certain issues actually looks like, and how we can leverage that momentum to really reshape this country and take out the unelected fourth branch of the U.S. government. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad that uh, SGU brought up uh, the ninth in conjunction with the petro dollar being dead. Uh, because that actually begets the next question, um, sort of segueing into the geopolitical financial, because obviously they, they kind of marry and bleed into one another. Um, speaking about last week's, we'll call it a debate to be generous, um, we know that that was a staged event with President Trump allowing the circus to occur so that ultimately the normies of the American people could see front and center what had been going on the entire time, uh, more than just the Democratic Party, but the, the deep state and all of its entrapments for many years. There was a part that was particularly interesting to me, SG, I don't know if you caught it, but there was a moment where Trump used the Biden to uh, say at one point that we have a thousand trillionaires. That struck me as very interesting on the financial front, because we know that, as you said, there are no coincidences, there are no happenstance, and you just talked about how the, the fake news hangs on every word he says, because they do know, as you said, to some degree, that he's putting out comms of truth on both ends, both for us and for the normies respectively. So with that being said, do you think there was a possible Freudian slip SG that Trump used through the Biden to hint at maybe the Zimbabwe bonds coming up in the future? Because you have 
Starlink satellites going up, as you know, this month for the elections in Zimbabwe. Next month, I believe it's slated, as I understand it now, for August 23rd, uh, where Nelson Chamisa is the people's president, like Trump, heavily favored to win there. And he did say one of his first order of business is to restore the economy specifically to bonds. So do you think there's maybe a correlation there? Well, I would say that the correlation is even at a more macro scale than that. And Zimbabwe is another cog in that in that wheel that is moving forward in the redistribution of wealth from the deep state occultic class back out to the rest of the peoples of the world. You know, if we look at just the Rothschild family, for example, $650 trillion under holdings just to one family. If you were to give a single trillion dollars to 650 people, you're more than halfway to a thousand at that point, just with the seizures of the assets of one deep state group. And we know that a number of Trump's executive orders have allowed for seizure of essentially the entirety of the deep state elitist class's assets. Anyone that was involved in major human rights abuses, international levels of large scale uh, criminality, any anyone that was involved in fraudulent activity pertaining to U.S. elections and issues directly in, you know, involved with U.S. national security. So this is essentially the, the largest footprint, I would say nine in 10 of that deep state class falling under that umbrella of those executive orders issued during a time of military national emergency here in the United States. So looking at the, the uh, statement, we have a thousand trillionaires, it would make sense that we have uh, positioned those assets and spent a great deal of time over the last seven years repatriating those assets back around the world to where they need to be. And now we're positioning ourselves at this day and in this time to begin a slow release of that out into the world. Because again, and I tell people you know, very frequently, those that out there follow things like Nasera Jacera and things like that, it does have to occur in a fashion that the world economy can absorb and handle. It's sort of like, you know, if you have someone that's starved of water, you don't want to have them drink from a hydrant, you'll kill them. You have to give them sips at first, and then as they become capable of handling more volume over time, and granted that time frame may very well be short, but they become capable of handling more volume, and so the pressure can be increased until there is a final equaliz equalization. And we are headed rapidly in that direction by the behavior of not only the worldwide financial markets, but the military-industrial complex locuses of control in response to that. Yeah, I agree. It's, uh, it, it does seem to be all kind of careening towards that inevitability. Uh, staying on the financial front a little bit longer, SG, you posted yesterday an article that really uh, caught my attention and with respect to uh, the U.S. Marshals partnering with Coinbase for crypto management. What, in your estimation, um, is so important about this, and what does that signify in, in the new upcoming economy? Well, it's it's difficult, I think, for patriots out there to realize at first how multidimensional the continuity of preservation and government operation in the United States currently underway actually is. That operation has split even a lot of the U.S. bureaucracy d uh, down the lines of pa uh, patriots and traders. And you have individuals in all of these agencies that have tried to be there for the right reason, for the right purpose, and for the right mission. And now they have the opportunity to actually do that. And of course, there are those uh, obviously that have been there as well, not for those reasons. And oftentimes those individuals work their way into the command and control structure because that's how it has always been. Now, I preface what I'm saying with that because it's important to come back to the Marshall Service. The Marshall Service in particular was highlighted by President Trump as certainly ancillary and perhaps even overlapping with military level law enforcement activities that are being undertaken in federal jurisdictional areas. And so those law enforcement activities would encompass all manner of criminality, right? Not just the trafficking component, not just uh, the, the witness protection component, not just the organized crime component, but the financial as well, as well as the kinetic, as well as the logistical. These are full scale operations that are being undertaken by the Marshal Service during this operation, as well as the U.S. National Guard to some degree. And those and we get into jurisdiction at that point, and I'm not 100 percent clear with that. So I don't want to you know, corroborate something for the audience that I can't clearly state is true. But what we know factually is that the National Guard uh, had deputized a number of thousands of soldiers into the U.S. Marshal Service for such a time as this. And when we look at the nature of financial criminality that has been undertaken around the world, but basing itself out of U.S. originating markets, it would fall under the jurisdiction of something like a federal slash military law enforcement operation to occur in, multi in multiple jurisdictions all at one time. The cryptocurrency market 
Coinbase, Binance, a lot of the other major exchanges, um, and their and their you know relevant investors and things of that nature has been a playground for dark money for a very long time. If you need to siphon something off of the budget so that you can repurpose it for something else, whether that's for good or for evil, without an easily traceable or in some cases entirely traceable uh, fashion, that's the way that you would do it. And one of the reasons we saw Bitcoin emerge in the early days as such a successful uh, digital coin is because it was allowing for untraceability of black market activity in sub-Saharan Africa and in the South South Asian continents and in South America, where a great deal of the criminal cartel operates with with respect to resources and the actual pilfering of the world. So the fact that Coinbase, which is now one of the major crypto exchanges and has been for a very long time, is now directly partnered with the Marshall Service for some sort of joint venture regarding U.S. Uh, uh, federal law enforcement involvement in cryptocurrency, whether that's management of assets, whether that's um, guidance that happening in the background that we wouldn't know about. What was so compelling to me is we had evidence to show that a component of this continuity operation that we've undergone here in the United States has gone after financial markets and financial pathways in a very targeted, very specific manner, and they are working their way through them. FTX, Binance, Coinbase, all of the others that have been uh, involved in either court litigation or investigative services, JP Morgan throughout the U.S. Virgin Islands. This is a coordinated operation occurring between interagency patriots, and I think the deep state warfare component of this fight for the audience out there to understand is that you have those patriots that are moving forward, but you have those agency traders across all of those agency arenas that are attempting to obfuscate and derail it. Mm. Good point. And, and once again, we're, uh, we're tracking SG in terms of our, um, you know, sort of attitudinal mindset on things, because kind of the next question I was going to talk about was with respect to uh, what's going on geopolitically in the court, uh, court cases, court situations, we, we saw the Supreme Court kind of extend out, I believe, early to early as early as uh, yesterday to extend and deliberate cases. Uh, you know, as you know, about a, a two days ago, they just rolled on a 40 year rolling on Chevron. Um, now you're seeing cases like the J6 and I believe the 2020 election that's going to be kind of waiting in the wings that case. What's the significance to you in terms of the Chevron outcome? And how do you see the rest of these aforementioned cases playing out in the next coming weeks slash months? Well, let's take it in two parts. We'll start with Chevron. Chevron itself is one of the most important court decisions we've seen in our lifetimes. Um, because what Chevron has done is it has, and, and this decision is, it has disempowered what was loosely called the Chevron Doctrine, which essentially said that if Congress writes a law and it's clear as mud, the agencies get to interpret it however they want to, and there's nothing you can do about it because they know how to interpret the law better than you, and, and in fact, better than the Congress as well. And so now we have the Supreme Court clarifying for the electorate and for the American population that, no, that's not true, and that's not how this works. Congress writes the laws. Congress has to plainly state what they mean by the laws, and agencies do not have sweeping and broad authority to write policy and regulations that are equivalent to laws based solely upon their own self-aggrandized determination of the same. And so in this process, we now have essentially the knees uh, cut out from every single bureaucratic three-letter agency. This is the most devastating Supreme Court decision to ever hit the bureaucratic alphabet mafia. We now have hundreds of federal agencies that can be taken to court um, um, after this Chevron doctrine ex decision has been uh, released, and they can be forced to clarify policies, procedures, and protocols, and where they align lawfully with duly passed laws. And if those can't be fully clarified in court, then we could surmise and speculate, and I'm not a legal scholar, but we could speculate that the, that the court under a truly objective conditions would likely side with uh, those that are alleging something is not truly clear if the other side cannot support that it is in fact clear. So what this does is it returns a great deal of power and decision-making authority, not just to the Congress, but also to the American business, the American business person, and whatever commercial institutions have to operate under the regulatory matrix. Not all uh, big box you know, stores, for example, are managed by bad people. They're just owned by bad uh, you know, large scale bad corporations at the very, very top of the chain. So when those corporations go go away, and I think we will eventually see that happen, we will see a decentralization of management and a, and probably a a a restructuring throughout a lot of industries 
for a more localized feel, a more localized appeal. And now we have a decision uh, codified by the Supreme Court that states that those entities, as well as all of your mom and pop small businesses out there, have true rights to question the actions of the regulatory beast. Mm -hmm. With yeah, regards uh, to the other part of the question, oh, sorry there. No, no, please, regards, please. To the other part of the question, these Supreme Court decisions to come up, I think you nailed it right on the head. I think that we're in a season now going towards uh, the October session where a number of decisions uh, will likely also be released. That'll be very important. Uh, October typically has a surprise. And I think the 2020 election uh, throughout a number of different cases that have been brought to uh, various circuits will go in a consolidated fashion before the court. People talk about Brunson. That's one of the more well-known ones. But there's a number of uh, cases that have gotten very high in the circuits around the United States with respect to the activities of our election system. And it's likely that we see a decision about this or from the Supreme Court about the validity of at least some of that leading into this 2024 election. It would certainly certainly prime the pump for the administration of objective justice here in the United States of America, but it would all it would have the ancillary and I think more important effect, John, of restoring confidence in the Supreme Court of the United States. One of the reasons we've gone so long in this nation without a true internal conflict, which you could make the case was fomented itself by foreign interests, is because we've always been willing as American citizens, citizens and as American people to respect the rules of the court and to respect what the courts have said. And we know throughout this process that in our judicial system, we've always had a, a method of redress up until the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is the last bastion of interpretation for our laws and how we apply things here in the nation. And so there has to be confidence and trust in that institution or our nation simply cannot move forward. It is a constitutional body. It's allocated by the framers uh, to adjudicate conflicts between citizenry and also conflicts between the states. And so we cannot finish this process process without something salvaging their reputation. And I think that we see something like a, a 2020 decision or perhaps even a, a different decision regarding um, uh, certain government privileges. Uh, people have talked about the the secrecy doctrine out of the um, the 1950s having gone before the court for argument and not having been decided on. So that's another one that could potentially be waiting in the wings. So we have a number of different choices here, but but I think you're right. At the end of the day, with regards to how these play out, they're going to get escalating in nature between now and November. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. I appreciate the articulation as, as our audience does as well. Um, just to wrap up this, this question to SG, um, a friend of ours of the podcast and friend in general, Dr. Scott Young, had made a, a very pointed uh, statement yesterday that uh, the Chevron case is also important in the aspect that uh, this frees up Nasara, and you mentioned that before, to move forward because it had to go through the judicial system for all to see, to, to play out through the proper channels. And as a result, uh, we would see not only the financial release, but also uh, the patents and things that we've been waiting on in many iterations in that, um, in that space or that field. Um, do you agree that, that, that there's some Nasara overrub to this decision with Chevron? Well, I think it's inarguable to say that it's the agency monster, the, the alphabet mafia bureaucratic beast, what we call the unelected fourth arm of government here in the United States that has stifled all innovation and creativity and invention here in our nation for a very, very long time. Um, we can go back as early as the late 1800s, early 1900s to see a lot of this alphabet state emerging in the form of congressionally appointed institutions and agencies. And we know in, in some regards, post-American Civil War, the Congress was essentially uh, hostages of foreign financial interests who had taken control of the United States and pressured even the president into what amounted to a, a coup against the Republic. So in this process, when we see something like Chevron rolled back, we certainly have the environment primed for the attacking of policies and procedures that, again, are not clarified um, um, with how they apply with respect to the, to the law as written. And in a lot of cases, they function primarily to punish those who are violating the policies, not because there is a true uh, legal problem, but because there is a profit problem uh, with respect to whatever someone has decided to bring to the table. And we could look at, you know, water powered engines for cars or, for example, with things like that. So with this decision, we have the the court, the court grid essentially prepared to attack anything that prevents the release um, of technology that is already released by the patent office and already declassified. 
And we know that that technology um, arena of declassification has been set off in a very significant way from the first Trump administration, right? We saw the Trump administration declassify things like zero point energy and the superconductive engines necessary to harness zero point energy. And now we have the Chevron doctrine essentially gutted and taken out of the way, stating that the agencies cannot block the introduction of that technology through unclear policy and protocol. Absolutely. And uh, not to not to beat a dead horse, SG, but there's just such a Pandora's box that comes, as you said, out of this monumental decision. Uh, last question on this subject. Uh, Errol had posted yesterday that not only did the Chevron case shed light on the issue, but it also opened up several government agencies from A to Z that he listed. Just some of many would be, examples would be the DOJ, FBI, IRS, and many others no longer having the power or jurisdiction over we the people. Um, so in your estimation, where do we where do we go from here and what does this mean for Americans going forward now that a lot of these agencies have been sort of defrocked, for lack of a better word? Well, I think that's that's a complex question and it's kind of difficult to answer. We run into the the fluidity issue with the the situation that we're in here in the United States, because we as Americans are observing all of these things happening in an original fashion, really for the first time in a half a century to a century in some regards, depending on which issue it is. And so with respect to the disempowerment of the regulatory matrix, we have to remember that a wounded dog can still bite. And so in this process, if you have patriots out there that are inventors or creators or innovators that have been stifled and attacked or, or have never wanted to bring something to the table because they were worried they would be stifled or attacked, I would still be cognizant of the possibility that you get some amount of pushback. But what I would keep in mind and I would allow me and, and what I would allow to drive me uh, forward in a, in a state of positive courage is the fact that we now have a decision codified on the record stating that if they cannot provide a clear basis and a plain text explanation of how what they're asking uh, a commercial organization or an entity of some kind to do and comply with, if they if they can't provide how that applies with related with relation to the law itself as written, or if there is not a law fundamentally stating something regarding the same, then it does not have to be adhered to as though it is a law. And so we do have um, you know the big guns back on our side, but we have to be willing to deploy those big guns to the field, and that's the patriotism spirit. I think, story throughout history, right? We have to be willing to take the action and potentially risk something for a reward. And that's the period of time that we're in now. And we've been given uh, essentially a lot more arrows in our quiver for that journey with this decision. Absolutely, 100%. And thank you again for all the articulation on, on just this one subject matter alone. Um, pivoting actually to another uh, court case SG that was pretty significant, we believe, and you may or may not have noticed it, but uh, yesterday in Davidson County, Tennessee, which is uh, in the Nashville area, typically a very liberal oriented area, specifically when it comes to uh, you know, judicial and, and governmental matters, uh, a decision was rendered in a landmark case yesterday when a federal jury, jury ordered Blue Cross Blue Shield to pay a former employee by the name of Tanja Benton uh, $700,000 after she refused with, for working for them to take the COVID vaccine. She sued them for wrongful termination and won. What kind of precedent, SG, do you think this sets for other individuals who are in a similar predicament? Well, I have to admit, John, I hadn't heard that news, and that's probably the most exciting news I've heard in a long time. That opens up, again, Pandora's box. That's the best way to describe it. Now we have legal precedent set within the jurisdiction of the United States, but also happening within the overlapping jurisdiction of the 50 states of the union, which means it applies in both common and maritime law jurisdictions. We now have that decision codified stating that you cannot uh, terminate someone because they refuse to undergo a medical procedure while working for you. This is a compelling decision. I'll have to read more about it to offer a, a more thoroughly digested opinion, but mm. I'm extremely encouraged by what you've just reported. Isn't that great? I mean, it was really jumped out at me and I, I thought it was noteworthy. So I appreciate you saying that. And uh, we'll, I, I do agree. I think it sets a precedent that is going to be like a ball of yarn that unravels for a lot of people who have unfortunately had to, uh, you know, risk their families, their careers, their, their livelihood just to do what they knew was, um, morally and health-wise, the right decision. Um, 
pivoting back to the finances issue, we haven't talked about this subject in a while, but I know you and I have both been watching it very uh, judiciously, so to speak. And that is with respect to Israel. Um, we're waiting on Israel, as you know, from our last discussion to hit the secret nuclear power plants of Iran in order to free Iraq and their people, both geopolitically and financially, especially to be free with respect to the dinar. Um, last week, you may or may not recall that um, Israel's finance minister said to America, quote, um, we're about to make a decision that's going to massively impact the Middle East and time is running out to stop uh, Iran's nuclear assaults that they have, their, their uh, assault and their nuclear weapons and drones and such. Uh, meanwhile, we also wait SG President Putin to finish off Ukraine optically. We know that that's already happened because as you're well aware, they've been helping Donbass and Lugansk, which are notable Russian provinces within uh, Ukraine. They're Russian nationalists, they speak Russian. They've been building up the infrastructure and the apartment complexes, houses and whatnot, food and water and all those other sundry medical needs. But we wait for the official sort of you know hammer to come down on uh, Ukraine so that uh, we believe Russia can join forces with China to do the Ukraine 2.0 with respect to the invasion of Taiwan, which you, all, you and I also talked about in the past, which in turn frees up Vietnam for their Vietnamese dong to flourish. Um, you were talking about Zimbabwe, well, we were talking about Zimbabwe earlier and the impact of um, you know, the Biden's comment, right? So swinging back to that a little bit, as you're also probably aware, Putin about a week and a half ago made a very important um, visit to Vietnam, meeting with Xi and of course, um, Kim Jong-un, and he officially backed the Vietnamese dong in 40% physical gold, 30% Russian bonds, and 30% Chinese bonds, which to me was certainly highly important and unprecedented. But so with all that said, SG, are you somewhat surprised that these invasions by both Israel and China haven't occurred yet? And if not, when, when do you surmise those might happen time-wise? Um, you know, I don't think I would be surprised right now that we've seen such sluggishness with respect to moving forward in these ways because the deep state uh, monster worldwide and that would include you know some of the nations you just described and it would include some of the nations we haven't talked about you know explicitly on the show today they're not in a hurry to move forward in a fashion that they know will result in their own destruction and yet they're in a period of time where you have patriotic actors in trusted positions worldwide putin's a good example of that that are moving the needle forward in such a fashion that their situation is untenable and they can't do nothing. They can't continue to sit and do nothing. So I think we're seeing them run out the clock in the biggest way that they can. The events of the Middle East to come along with the Pacific Theater, um, I think you're going to see those happen around the time that Putin goes into Kiev. Uh, I don't see. I don't think it's going to be very long, actually, until we see a, a true campaign on the Ukrainian capital from Russia because Russia is, is simply not going to sit by and continue uh, to allow this to escalate from the NATO, you know, warmonger side. And there's a lot of biologic agent trafficking that Russia is seeking to get under control that actually comes out of the Kievan provinces and those that are immediately west and southwest of those provinces down towards Kimilnitsky and then uh, west towards Lvov. So this is a corridor that comes out of Ukraine. Uh, Putin's very well aware of it, I'm sure, as is a lot of the military forces of the world, I would think, at this point. And so seeing something like that campaign, I think we could expect... Uh, sort of coinciding with that to see some escalation coming out of the Middle East. With that timetable, and we're now at midsummers here in 2024, I would think that we would need to see some amount of gear movement between both of those arms of this, uh, this triangular worldwide conflict that we're referencing. We would need to see that movement within the next 30 to 45 days. Uh, Israel is already engaged in active warfare operations with Hezbollah at the localized areas of the northern border. That operation is going to turn into a northern uh, northern facing invasion into Lebanon, which will spark Syria's involvement in the war. You'll see this rapidly expand, I think, because as Syria comes into the war, Iran will get involved in the war and we'll have that Israeli-Iran conflict that you just described a moment ago with respect to their uh, arsenal and the things that they've managed to pile up. With Iran into the conflict officially at this point, and I think all of this could happen within a matter of a week or two, uh, we'll see Saudi Arabia at least opine on it, pot potentially come in on a specific side. 
Egypt will absolutely come in on a specific side, probably that of Saudi Arabia, if Saudi Arabia comes into the fore. And Turkey is not going to stand by and allow Israel to walk into Damascus and just decimate the countryside and level the capital. And I think you're going to see a significant attack on Damascus throughout this period of time that I'm referencing right now. And we'll see Turkey's involvement activating their their very large army. And they have a very large standing army and a very capable NATO-equipped fighting force. So Turkey is not a, a card I think we should underestimate in this process. While all of this is going on, and again, this this you could see the transpiration of events that I just described inside of a 30 to 40 day period from beginning to 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 true escalation. You you would see, I would think, or or you could see the movement of China on Taiwan with respect to the the you know invasion of the island there. I could see the Philippines becoming a military target as because they're used as a launching point for a lot of NATO based or what you would call Western aligned, central banking aligned industrial complex fighting forces. Uh, Kim has been openly telling Seoul that the crap storm is coming, literally sending them balloons filled with excrement, filled with refuse, filled with uh, defecative materials. The North Korean military has been actively involved in industrializing the demilitarized zone, and actually uh, the South Korean uh, side of the zone fired warning shots the other day at the North. What they've been doing is they've been building roads uh, and a couple of bridges on their side of the demilitarized zone, which is clearly prepping the pathway and the infrastructure to move large amounts of equipment, large amounts of personnel and people southward. So we know in the, in the Korean unification, you know, part of this, John, is going to come in this maelstrom of conflict as well. And so it gets you know, very large very quickly uh, with respect to the inflation of these things. I think in this process, because because it's likely that they happen very rapidly, You'll see that U.S. dollar, petrodollar collapse under its own weight. There just won't be enough demand uh, for the dollar with the remaining demands, or excuse me, with the emerging demands of, of the warfare situation based with the countries that are involved in the conflict. And nobody is, is wanting to do business with the U.S. dollar anyway because of the Federal Reserve System's weakness and the collapse and the stagflation that has occurred in the global north markets. So all of this converges, and we can see if we come out to an 85,000-foot view that we have operations in multiple theaters that are all stressing uh, coordinated, connected international pathways. But yet at the same time, they are achieving regional rebalancing or regional purging that needs to happen of what we would call that deep state monster. Organ trafficking is a huge problem in the Middle East, for example, and Turkey is well aware of that because their country has been used as the primary pathway for the same because of their connection to what was formerly Constantinople and is now modern day Istanbul. Um, the same is true with Egypt for the exact same reasons, right? The same is true with Saudi Arabia for the exact same reasons. So when we look at the reconciliation of these conflicts, they're serving a number of different goals, a number of different objectives. But worldwide, we will see the collapse of the petrodollar caused, I think, primarily by what remains in this scenario between now and November. Yeah, I'm tracking with USG on the time frame because it makes complete sense that they would want to do these strikes with respect to you know Israel and and uh, China Taiwan pr prior to President Trump coming back in optically because we know he's going to power up the military and that'd be the worst time for them to do it, right? Is they want to do it while the, sort of the proverbial uh, you know drawbridge is down. Um, so yeah, no, I'm I'm with you on that. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you real quick, just a couple more questions. It's interesting to note that. Uh, they have made a move now where they're delaying the quote sentencing of President Trump and even talking about kind of throwing it out all together because they obviously have nothing. So beyond the obvious significance of that, um, how do you see that court case or that situation playing out along with the conjunction of, you know, J6 in 2020? Do you see a, a common thread or do you see them as mutually exclusive? You know, that's a difficult analytical question. Um, primarily, I think that we're going to see a, a playing out that preserves Trump's legacy because that's that's sort of been the flavor of all of this worldwide throughout the entire process, right? Since 2016, uh, the man is essentially the cleanest billionaire that's potentially ever lived. Uh, and we now have that proven out through a number of different hoaxes and witch hunts and investigations and court cases and things of that nature. So the immunity decision that recently came down, which I think affects a lot of this, uh, is very fascinating to me. We have immunity for official acts and no immunity for unofficial acts. And the Supreme Court has now, for the first time, articulated that there is a difference. 
which implies that not everything a president can do can be claimed to be official. There are certain things that exceed what you would call the official capacity or the official need uh, of the authority for, for that decision or that purpose. So how that applies to Trump's cases right now, I, I think that we could see um, you know, a moving forward of the sentencing for sure. We've already seen you know a delay introduced into the process. We could see something um, very quickly decided on appeal, stating that he can't be prosecuted for things that he's done, you know, in office. And this could be the vector where we have the courts, you know, highlight uh, the 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 question that's on everybody's lips, which is what is official and what is unofficial, right? That's that's the the next question that patriots have after seeing this this high court decision. And we could see the Trump cases actually prove out in the lower court systems based on appeal. Uh, and based on the 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 measures that are taken against President Trump to actually see what um, that interpretation should look like. i'm not, I'm really optimistic about that, actually. How that pertains to uh, the January sixth situation, I think I would need a little bit more study time to opine uh, knowledgeably about that, but I'm very encouraged by what that could potentially mean for a lot of those individuals caught up in j six because it comes back to the idea of who can be. Uh, uh, prosecuted for something that was done under an official circumstance and who can be prosecuted for something that was unofficial. Uh, and that's been a basis of a lot of the persecution for President Trump uh, regarding January 6th, but it's also been the basis of persecution for individuals that were involved in their official duties, whether it's an FBI agent, whether it was a a person on site in an official capacity acting on behalf of a, a congressional staff member, for example, um, and others. We have we have this this uh, jurisdictional, or excuse me, this um this conditional approach to this that could be very infectious. I think in in a lot of those cases, but we would need, I think, better clarification and interpretation first on what official and unofficial really mean, and that's I think the next step in this process. Yeah, absolutely, that makes sense. Um, one last comment and then the last question for you for today, SG. Uh, going back a second to Israel and Iraq and the whole of the Middle East, because like you said, it isn't just affecting um, you know, Iraq or even just Vietnam. It's the entire Middle East will be affected, like you said, Turkey, uh, Lebanon, and we're dealing with the Lebanese pound that has a 90% devaluation. We know that typically currencies that devalue that much tend to revalue and boomerang the other way. That's the typical cycle of things as you're aware. But the whole of the Middle East and every every country, like you said, Turkey will be effectuated. Um, you look at countries like Kuwait, Oman, Saudi Arabia, uh, Dubai, and there's a lot more in common that they have than people might realize with regards to this topic, right? And that is they're thriving because they don't have a proxy government and they don't have U.S. militias ensconced within their government so they can flourish. And I think that's why this, this move with Israel from the great, uh, you know, prophet Kim Clement of the, uh, you know, Israel uh, will be a break in the financial system by by hitting the Iran, Iranian power plants becomes so significant because it allows uh, Iraq to finally break free from the U.S. militias and the corrupt Iranian proxies so they can flourish like a lot of their counterparts throughout the whole of the Middle East. Um, the final question being is, there's a lot of discussion about the Biden and and is he going to run for the last couple of months? Are they going to have a change of batter with maybe Michelle Obama? And then there's not a lot of talk about it, which is interesting, SG, because, you know, in past deep state presidential selections, um, you usually know who the, the candidate's VP is, usually a year or two, a year and a half in advance. And President Trump still hasn't announced who his VP is going to be. So my question is, who do you imagine his VP will be? And do you think the Biden will stay in there, or do you think somebody like Michelle Obama will supplant him? You know, it, it would just be completely pure speculation on my end with respect to Trump's VP, and I want the audience out there to know that. I really truthfully have no idea. Um, but I would think with what we have seen publicly, those that have been introduced publicly and have been hinted at it publicly, if we roll with that group as being the group where it actually comes from, my guess would be Ben Carson. Um, if it's not from the group that we've seen so far, and which is entirely possible, uh, then I would just be, you know, pulling straws out of the ether, having no clue really and no basis. And I don't want to do that. I've heard everything from, you know, individuals that we know that have um, 
well, really sort of gone into witness protection is the, is the best way to describe it for the broadcast today. We've got everything from, you know, gender considerations that have been fielded out there, a lot of which have a, a very strong, reasonable basis and make a lot of sense. So at the end of the day, I think that it's it's really, truly a great mystery. And he's clearly keeping it under wraps for a strategic purpose. There is something yet to happen here in the United States, I think, before this announcement can come out and be made, though it though my understanding is it's supposed to be made by the time you arrive at the convention, because people need to know what the entirety of the ticket is actually going to look like and appear to be. Um, so we're coming up on time frame with that. I think we're within the two-week window. It's going to be very exciting to see what comes out as a result of that. We may see an extraordinary situation granted to Trump as a result of this political persecution, where he has a time extension to announce that, and I, and I wouldn't put that past you know, the irregular warfare landscape that we're all living in. But with regards to, you know, whoever it is, it's going to be a very significant decision because the vice president, I think, in this next term will assist the states in returning to their jurisdictional sovereignty. The vice president was always the, supposed to be the agent of the 50 states of the union or the states of the union in general, alongside the president who was the people's president, right? The, the person who ran the show and was elected by the electoral college through popular vote within the territories and states that were admitted. So in this process, that, that particular role will be important. Uh, there's jurisdictional things that are going to have to get ironed out, probably codified uh, uh, into you know government operations moving forward here in the United States to prevent the scenarios that we've seen, uh, which have occurred over the last 150 or so years. Um, but with respect to the the current choice of it, if I was to give a guess based on the those that have been presented publicly as options, it would be Dr. Carson. Hmm. Now, I would personally, I know a lot of people are concerned about that pick, but I, I think it'd be a very good pick for him and from a faith and uh, leadership perspective. I think he's got a lot more to bring to the table than most people might, you know, surmise to your point. Um, SG, uh, last thought you have for the audience and where can people as always find your work? I can be found online in three different places. I'm on rumble.com slash user slash Q news Patriot. I am on truth social at the handle real SG Anon with a red check mark. And I'm on X formerly Twitter at the handle the T H E Q news Patriot. Very good. Well, thank you for joining us as always, SG. It's always a pleasure to have you on. We look forward to having you again in the near future. And thanks for your time and valuable information. We pray you have a blessed day and a very happy Independence Day as this promises to be uh, the change for many upcoming in the future. You as well, my friend. Thank you for having me back. Happy Independence Day to you and your family and for the audience out there. It's going to be a good one. God bless. God bless everyone.